In this video lecture for Water in the West, we're going to be going over and introducing and developing a working understanding of what a hydrological model is, because that's going to be really important in this module in which we will apply a hydrologic model to try and simulate a runoff hydrograph. So before we get going into the actual content, um, here is a review of the module learning objectives. And these um, are linked directly to the overarching course learning objectives. So at the end of this module, you should be able to describe the purpose of a hydrologic model and list several reasons why they are used. A little bit about explaining how derivatives and integrals might manifest in the hydrologic sciences, listing the co components of the water balance at the watershed scale, that's going to be critical in designing our model, and demonstrating how to write a balance equation for conservation of water in particular. So um, when I teach a whole class about modeling, um, I, I spend maybe a f the first lecture um, going over sort of a philosophical discussion of what a model is. And what I've found over the years is that the easiest way of actually doing that is to just start off with a simple example. Okay, so what, what is a model? So here is a, a contrast and a comparison between what a model is um, and, and the actual underlying thing that that model is seeking to, to replicate. So on the left-hand side here, we have a real Airbus A380. This is the giant double-decker, uh, long-range, long-haul aircraft um, developed by Airbus. And on the right here, we have a, a model of an Airbus A380. This particular model is, is a radio-controlled model, meaning that um, it also flies, but it is sort of spatially scaled down um, from the, the actual Airbus A380. And so if we, if we go through, and I have my classes kind of do this, um, and we, we go through and sort of contrast the things that are common between the, the model and the underlying reality, and those things that are dissimilar, okay? So um, if we were to go through and list some of the things that are similar about the model and the reality, some of those things might be that, well, okay, they, they both have similar shape, right? So they have a, a round fuselage, two wings with winglets, four engines, a tail, right? Um, so that's one commonality is just their, their shape or their form factor. Um, another one is that they both fly, right? So this is a, a real aircraft that transports people. This is a radio aircraft, radio controlled aircraft. Okay. Um, they, uh, yeah, the other, other similarities between them, um, you know, might, might include, for instance, that, you know, both of them use uh, jet engines, right? So these are large Rolls-Royce engines. These are sort of small gas turbine engines, right? Um, and we could go on. We could find other similarities between um, between these, these two, the, the model and the reality. But it's also helpful to talk about what the dissimilarities are, right? What are, what are the things that are uh, perhaps simplified or completely absent of, um, uh, in the model compared to the actual reality? So, okay, well, there's some obvious ones here, right? So this is much smaller, right? So it's not as large as the underlying original. It is what we would call scaled down. Right, so that's dissimilar. They may be the same shape, but they're certainly not the same size. Uh, this aircraft is piloted by pilots who are on board to the aircraft. This aircraft, the model aircraft, is piloted by pilots that are on the ground here. Um, and clearly this aircraft here, the model aircraft, doesn't carry any people, right? It doesn't have any passengers to it, whereas that is not true of the actual aircraft. Um, and we could go on and on again, you know, there's probably more dissimilarities than there are similarities in this case. You know, you could talk about how um, there's differences between these engines. Um, certainly the, the avionics, the electronics that are responsible for controlling things like navigation are very different between the reality 
and the model, but you get the idea, right? So um, a, a model has some things that are similar to the underlying reality that it is trying to represent, but it also has uh, some simplifications. And you know, we might think about why those simplifications are or, or how you decide which simplifications to make. So on this next slide, we'll just kind of review some bullet points that summarize kind of based on this example, what, what a model is. So a model is just a stand-in for reality. Um, you might also hear it sometimes referred to as an abstraction of reality, right? So, and there are many different kinds of models. There are physical models. So, um, you know, models of, of river systems that are made of playground sand. Um, there are, you know, there's there's many other types of models that um, that we could think about, um, but they are all standing in for reality in some way, shape, or form. Um, in this particular lecture and this week in the lab, we are going to specifically talk about and focus on numerical models or representations of watershed response or watershed stream flow in response to things like precipitation and and runoff. Any model retains some degree of functionality that tries to mimic the actual, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be making a model, right? So in the in the case of the the radio control aircraft, what it's trying to mimic is, you know, looking like the real aircraft in flight, right? It's trying to mimic the flight. It's trying to mimic the appearance of the aircraft in flight, right? Um, so whenever we have a model or any, you know, we always will have, uh, you know, be thinking about what what part of reality or what is it about the real world that this model is trying to actually represent and mimic. That's a really important question that we will um, explore as as hydrologists this week. And, and uh, the upshot is, is that we are trying to mimic the streamflow hydrograph this week, right? We are trying to mimic what the actual stream flow looks like that we might observe at uh, a river gauge along um, a river that we're interested in studying. Other facets of the model compared to reality are simplified, right? So again, going back to our radio controlled aircraft, uh, it is scaled down. The electronics, the engines are much more simpler, right? Um, there, if you look d you know, in close detail, there's a lot of things that are actually missing. They're not sort of real windows, they're just decals. Um, on the fuselage, right? So a lot of those facets are, are either absent or, or simplified when we compare the, um, the model to reality. And the, the key insight that uh, I'd like you to sort of come away with is that uh, when you're developing or using a model um, that is trying to mimic reality in some way, the, those behaviors that you um, uh, that are chosen to be simplified and those that are chosen to be sort of more representative of reality completely depend on the purpose of the model, right? So it's really important anytime you in your future career, whether you're a hydrologist or not, um, and somebody asks you to apply a model of any sort, um, it's important to sort of take a step back and, and make sure that you understand the why, right? Why am I using this model? What is the particular application um, that we are seeking to, to, to do with this model? To, why are we using this, this model? Why are we developing a new model? What is it that we're trying to predict? What do we have as inputs? What things can we um, simplify? What things are completely unnecessary as we represent the model? And what are those things that are that are critical um, that, you know, if we, we built a model and it doesn't capture um, it, you know, we will have built a piece of uh, numerical code or uh, a spreadsheet that is completely useless, right? So, um, so it's always important as a modeler to be thinking about what the application of the model is. That's always essential because um, modeling always involves choices and, and trade-offs between uh, realism or fidelity to reality and um, simplification on the other hand. Um, 
And it's the model builder that makes these decisions. And, and hopefully that model builder or user is careful in making those decisions, right? So that's, that's really essentially why it's important to step back anytime you begin using a model and ask the question, well, why is this model being used? So that leads us to, um, I want to cover this table from the reading in the module this week, which is, I, I think, a really great sort of table. It's a, it's a pretty simple table, but just kind of gives you a, um, a, you know, a, a laundry list of different reasons that you might use a model, right? So we might be interested in understanding how changes in land use and land cover affect runoff. Right. We might want to understand, for instance, um, as the city of Meridian and CUNA and Nampa Caldwell continue to urbanize and as we convert agricultural lands to subdivisions and, and pavement and parking lots, what does that do um, you know, to our stream flow, for instance, in, in some small rivers or streams, or what does that do to runoff? Right. So we might want to use a model to uh, explore different scenarios of land use, land cover change, and understand um, how those how those might impact our runoff and our stream flow. Um, another one here is drought forecasting, right? So maybe what we want to do is uh, look out um, a few months into the future and kind of take into consideration some climatological features that may be at play that we have some reason to be uh, reason to believe will be at play over the next several months and we might want to make a prediction about you know how much water demand the crops will have or whether the crops will have sufficient demand um, or sufficient water to meet those demands right so we might want to do some drought forecasting and planning so that we could for instance communicate to uh, farmers and growers, hey, you know, you might want to buy crop insurance this year, or, you know, you may want to go with a cultivar that's a little more drought tolerant this year because we think it's, you know, there might be some more drought this year, right? Um, another one is flood risk pr prediction, right? So this has uh, become a, a very hot issue in and around Boise. So uh, around Garden City, um, uh, you know, right adjacent to the Boise River, uh, as the as the climate warms and we we expect potential changes in runoff regimes and flow regimes in the Boise River that potentially changes what the flood stage is um, of the river in in some future scenario and so we want to understand how that risk is changing through time so those of you that are coffee aficionados if you go to push and pour over there in Garden City you know is is Garden City for instance um, is, is push and pours risk of flooding getting higher with the changing climate? Um, and, you know, is, is there something that, that they might want to do about that, right? Will they potentially need to buy flood insurance uh, to insure against losses due to floods? So any hydrologic model in particular um, has three key ingredients that we are, uh, that, that, will be included in it and we're what i'm going to do is run through these three ingredients um, in the process of sort of building what we call a conceptual model and um, those three ingredients are um, first a statement of conservation of of water mass uh, or water volume right we will say that that um, the our watershed system is not creating or destroying water volume that all of the water in is accounted for by water that's going out or changes in storage that all of those are, are in balance right so we will write a balance equation for conservation of of water <clears throat> volume for our watershed the next um, ingredient is every hydrologic model contains some kind of logic or some kind of rationale with how the different um, elements of the watershed are connected to one another right so when i say plumbing here I, I literally mean sort of you know how the tubes from one part of the watershed connect to another and those may be in space right different sub watersheds that are you know connected to one another one sub watershed that's up 
upstream of another watershed, sub watershed, they may be sort of conceptual bins. And that's what we're going to explore in, in, in our slides today. Um, so for instance, when we covered our runoff generation mechanisms, we talked about uh, infiltration excess and through flow, right? Um, so we want to understand how those are connected together. How are they plumbed together? How is the infiltration excess um, getting water to the channel? And how does that potentially differ from how um, the through flow is getting water to our, our stream, stream channel, okay? Um, so we need to decide, make decisions, and um, and create some logic with how the facets, the components of our watershed are plumbed together. And then uh, the final um, thing that we need is we need some rules, and these are just equations. We need to specify how the water moves through that plumbing, right? So we need to, to create um, either from sort of physical principles, um, you know, or kind of um, physical laws of how water moves under the influence of potentially energy gradients um, or conceptual rules or equations with, with um, you know, ways that we think are good representations of the movement of water um, from one part of our watershed to another part. So um, we're going to go through kind of each of these and, and show how you might build um, build a model over the next slides. Um, and what I want to do, though, is is kind of give you a real quick bucket of, of what this, or I'm sorry, a real quick visual of what this conceptual model is going to look like. And so um, here is, this box here represents our system. And our system here is is a watershed, right? So, you know, it's, it's just a box. Um, and, you know, the things that go into that watershed are, you know, so out here is the environment, right? This is the environment. This is the system. And this is a, a watershed. And um, the way that the, the, the system is related to its environment is that the watershed takes input in the form of precipitation from the environment, and it provides output in the form of evapotranspiration from the watershed to the environment as well as stream flow, right? So um, the precipitation comes in and the ET and stream flow go out, okay? So, Inside that watershed, we have kind of two, two sub buckets, two subsystems, or actually sort of three subsystems, right? Where water can be stored and where water moves, and so um, the way this is the this is our our plumbing, right? So how are these plumbed together? So in this case, um, our uh, we have precipitation coming in when it comes into the system. Our rule, it looks like, says that it will go into the soil bucket, right? That soil bucket has a fixed capacity, but it also has a, a leak in it. It has a, a spigot in it, and it is contributing um, water to the hill slope bucket, which is meant to represent our through flow, right? And then it looks like uh, that is also a leaky bucket, and that leaky bucket... Um, delivers water to the actual channel, right? Um, and that channel then releases stream flow to the environment, right? So, so this is our conceptual model. And in the next set of slides, what we're going to do is develop the, um, the, the mass conservation um, equation. We're going to uh, decide how these are plumped together, and then we're going to create some rules with how water kind of moves within our watershed, right? Um, so that um, we can we can understand and begin to describe that motion in a way that you know we might be able to sort of make a numerical prediction. Okay, so the first thing that we would want to do is write a mass balance statement for that for this watershed. And this, you know, this is, this is no, um, 
you know, this is not a trick question, right? Um, well, all that we are trying to do here is account for the inputs to the system and the outputs from the system. Yes, the system has some components that make it a little bit more complex, but this statement is the same statement that you know we've been sort of considering all throughout the course of the semester, and that is that um, we have on on one hand we have um, precipitation coming in, so that tends to increase the amount of water in the system, and then we have evapotranspiration coming out from our system, and then we have discharge also leaving, right? So the out arrows have minuses associated with them because they tend to decrease the amount of water stored in the system, and the sign in front of the precipitation P is positive because uh, precipitation tends to increase the amount of water stored in the system. Okay, and what are we keeping track of? So what is the difference of these equal to? Well, it's just equal to the change in storage, delta S over delta T over time, right? So the change in storage um, with time is just equal to um, the precipitation minus the evapotranspiration minus the stream flow, right? So if we had, for instance, measurements of uh, precipitation, evapotranspiration, and stream flow over some period of time, let's say a month, and we actually plugged numbers in here, right? If we got that um, P minus ET minus Q was less than zero, so it was negative, that would imply that our our watershed, right, is our change in storage with respect to time is less than zero, and our watershed is losing storage, right? Losing water storage is decreasing, right? So water is coming out of storage, decreasing. Okay, so water storage is decreasing. If we if we did the you know conversely if we did the same thing if we had a really wet month let's say uh, this is uh, Dry Creek watershed or the Boise watershed in February we get lots of snow there's not a lot of energy so there's not a lot of um, evapotranspiration right there's also not a lot of discharge because all of this precipitation is coming as snow and resulting in you know snowpack storage that would mean that P minus ET minus Q is greater than zero, meaning that storage in our watershed would be increasing. Okay, so here is our statement of mass balance. Okay, right. So that's ingredient one. Ingredient number two is the plumbing. Right. So how do these? How? What is the logic? Right. With how this um, this watershed works well it looks like you know if we have a bucket here you know so so it turns out we actually have not one but three storage variables right we have water stored in here I'm going to call this s1 this is storage one this is storage two this is the second bucket and then this is storage three right and that's our our channel storage bucket so there's water stored in the soil, there's water stored sort of in the hill slopes, and there's water stored in the buckets. And so so the total storage, total storage is S1 plus S2 plus S3. Okay. And in addition to this, right, so we have our total storage variable. Then we have some rules about how the water um, moves between these buckets, right? So, so if we follow the logic here, right? So, um, precipitation goes into storage bucket number one, right? And any any loss, right, um, from storage one goes into storage two. Okay, so storage two is connected to, I'm sorry, storage, 
storage one goes into storage two and storage two looks like it goes into storage three right and storage three goes into our stream flow okay so so you know the the pathway is a little bit complex along the way but this sort of makes sense right so um, precipitation coming in can fill up this soil bucket um, and it can leak into the hill slope bucket s2 the hill slope bucket leaks into the channel bucket s3 and s3 is is the the river and stream network and it sort of leaks out of the system out of our watershed as stream flow okay so that's what i mean by plumbing that's how we you know have to construct the plumbing now for a different model this could be um, a completely different set of plumbing decisions right you might have kind of two different um, two different leaky buckets right um, you might have uh, a snow bucket up here where you're making a decision about whether or not the precipitation is rain or snow and then routing it accordingly right so but for our system this is the decisions that we make about um, how the plumbing of the watershed actually works okay now it's important to underscore here too that you know this is not this is not right nor is it wrong right this is a conceptual model we are making decisions as to how we might want to represent this okay so we're going through this as an example but there's infinitely many different ways of doing it and and those different ways um, those different ways of, of creating buckets and connecting those buckets to one another have merit, right? Especially when they're coming from a perspective of like, well, you know, I actually think that it's not just a hill slope. There's maybe a groundwater bucket or, you know, um, my channel bucket is actually, you know, there's actually sort of two channel buckets. There's one that's kind of a, um, for the entrenched valleys in the um, upstream and then kind of the low-lying, you know, delta region um, downstream right so uh, you might construct the model differently depending on your un understanding of the system and that brings value right so what's important to know as a modeler is that there's no one right model and often exploring several good models is a really good practice okay so that's how our watershed is plumbed um, now we would then make sort of decisions as to how water gets from one bucket to the other right and what this might look like for instance is that this outflow here right um, let's if this is again storage one so this is reservoir one or bucket one uh, bucket two and bucket three right what comes out of here we might denote as um, the 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 flow from say one to two right so this is a, a, a flow of water out of storage bucket one into bucket two so q12 and similarly this would be you know q23 right um, yeah what we what we would then need to do is just say okay how what tell me the rule or tell me the equation that describes how i would compute this q12 if i knew what the storage is right so and um, a very common first approach right so we might say one way of doing this is to say okay well um, q12 my my flow out of my soil bucket to my hill slope bucket is just equal to a constant times the storage in bucket one right and um, this is this is what's known as uh, a, a, a linear reservoir in modeling speak um, and it's actually a very appealing model right because it intuitively makes sense to us right and when I say it intuitively makes sense um, I want you to real quick think about uh, um, if you were to for instance have um, a sponge right and you you ran that sponge under the faucet and uh, the 
you know, you sort of let that, um, you, you took the sponge after you sort of wet it, running it under the faucet, and you just sort of let it drip, right? At the beginning, it would drip really fast, right? Um, it would be sort of a steady stream, and if you just held that sponge there and let it continue to drip, it would just keep dripping and dripping and dripping, but it would slow down, right? It would slow down as, as time went on, and the reason it would slow down is that, you know, the, the, um, the sponge, the, the voids in the sponge are kind of running out of water, right? So you're sort of depleting the bigger and bigger um, void spaces in the sponge, and now you're getting to the smaller and smaller ones, and because of surface tension, those are kind of harder to, to dewater. And so um, as you go through time, as your sponge loses storage, the flow rate out of your sponge slows down. And so that's what this approach sort of does, is it conceptually says, well, I want my flows to be higher when there's more storage in the water, and I want my flows to be zero when, or lower when there's less storage in the water. And you can also see that, well, this makes sense too, when there's no storage in my bucket, if, there, if the water storage here is zero, my flow should be zero, right? So a constant times zero is always gonna be zero meaning that I wouldn't get any flow out of this bucket, right? So we need to come up with these, with rules like this that um, allow us to quantify, develop kind of the numerical rules for our that plumbing of our watershed, okay? So this is an example of how we might do it for these two buckets. Let's simplify it even more, and let's go through a specific example of how we will do this, and this is gonna connect the, with the next module video on um, the mathematics of how we actually solve models like this. Um, so we're going to go through this same exact example, but for this situation here in which we have a single bucket, right? So this is this is now our watershed. We just have one storage variable, but we have the same fluxes, precipitation coming in, ET going out, and stream flow coming out as well, right? So let's go through these same um, uh, same same three kind of steps of defining the mass balance statement, uh, deciding on the plumbing, and creating the flux rules, and then we'll write sort of an, an all-encompassing um, equation for uh, the the whole watershed, which we will then solve numerically in the next uh, in the next lecture. Okay, so. Again, the mass balance statement, again, is we're just keeping track of the change in storage of our watershed with respect to time. And that is equal to precipitation coming in. So precipitation tends to increase water storage. The sign is positive. ET is going out, right? It it extracts water from our watershed, so it would tend to push water storage down, so the sign is negative, and the same with stream flow, okay? Okay. The plumbing is a lot simpler here, right? We have precipitation contributes to uh, watershed storage, and watershed storage contributes to uh, stream flow. So there's our kind of pr plumbing relationship, okay? All right, and again, in this case, um, what we're gonna say is that the, the loss of water from our uh, bucket, from our watershed, is just going to be proportional to the storage. So the flux rule that we're going to develop is just to say, okay, so Q is just equal to K times the storage value, right? So again, it's the same, uh, what we refer to as, as a, a linear reservoir. Right, so um, it's just a constant value K times the storage is equal to the, the stream flow, okay? All right, so now if we put all of that together and we write um, uh, an overall equation for this watershed, we will get um, that the change in storage with respect to time 
is equal to the precipitation minus ET. And then we're going to substitute, we're going to substitute this flux rule here for this Q value here. And we're going to say that the discharge now is just K times S. Okay. All right. Now, um, it's not apparent immediately right now why this is kind of uh, um, helpful. But um, what I'm going to pose is that in the next module, what we're going to do is we're going to treat this as, as the so-called forcing to our system. Right. So this is, you can think of this as the, the net precipitation. So the precipitation minus the evapotranspiration is sometimes referred to as the net precipitation or the, um, the net of what makes it into our kind of watershed system for, for stream flow. And, and so this is usually something that's given or measured. We measure this, right, with, um, with our, uh, well, measurement. Um, we measure this. This is what we measure with weather stations or uh, our snow tell sites, right? They have that, that precip and temperature values that we could use to get the precipitation and evapotranspiration to get this net precipitation. So, so this is a this is a given anytime we're modeling. This is an input to our model. Okay. Um, what we don't know here is these storage values, but that is what we would be solving for. We would be solving for water watershed storage. Okay. Um, and you might ask, okay, well, that's great. You know, now I know how much water is in my watershed. If I do that watershed storage, right, if I was able to solve this with these givens, and I was able to solve for watershed storage, that would just give me a storage. Why is that helpful? Well, going back to that flux rule, right, remember that our discharge is just equal to some constant times that storage, right? So whatever this constant is, we would multiply that times the storage to get our discharge, right? And then ultimately this is, again, so this is our prediction And this is what we would compare to reality. So we would compare this to our to our gauged stream flow. Okay. All right. So there we have it. We built a simple model. This is, you know, um, the the models that are used in practice um, or in research. Are, are mathematically in some way, you know, you'd find equations that are that are identical to this somewhere in those models. Um, and so this is um, perhaps profound because it sort of pulls back the curtain on what is often kind of a very, um, you know, maybe intimidating subject for students to sort of say that, you know, at the end of the day, all that's there is just kind of a, a mass balance equation Right, some rules and assumptions with how the the rooms of the watershed, so to speak, are plumbed together, and then some mathematical rules with how the flow in that plumbing works, um, and and then you know the rest is just kind of um, gathering the data to put into the model. Um, we'll talk a little bit about in the lab. We're going to be focusing on the subject of calibration, right? So um, figuring out what, what K is kind of the correct K to get Q, uh, the discharge as close to our observed discharge as possible. Um, and the rest is just kind of turning some mathematical cranks that are, you know, real simple kind of algebra actually when it comes down to it, you'll see in the next, in the next module. And so although, you know, modeling is a, is a very sometimes, um, you know, it can seem a little bit daunting because 
it involves like lots of computers and code and lots of data and you know analyzing some you know some things uh, at the core of it it's um, it's not that different from you know what we've been doing a lot of in water in the west already right writing balance equations thinking about what our equations or what our system is what our components are where the water is stored um, devising some rules for how that water moves between systems um, and and then just sort of just you know the rest is collecting good data and and doing some math so okay